Patrick is gonna say a few things. Thank you, Dr. Zing. Um, my name is proving body, so if you all bear with me. In March, the Bay Area went into lockdown. The SARS-CoV-2 virus has touched us all. Since that time, we've had a rise in 13% to unemployment, over 29 million infected cases, and over 525,000 deaths, with countless more suffering crippling injuries, debt, lost businesses, and lost loved ones. All of us here today in some way have been in the virus. And it is so important now to listen to our experts. Experts like Dr. George Rutherford, who has served as the Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer for the CDC and the head of the Division of Infectious Disease and Global Epidemiology, Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UCF, and Dr. Jenna Boyke, the clinical focus in internal medicine. Thank you doctors for coming tonight to speak to us. Thanks. So um, I'm going to take it away and, and start off, and then uh, Jenna is going to come in uh, after me. So um, hold on to your hats. Here we go. Um, so um, I, I, I'm going to do some background uh, uh, discussion uh, about uh, some of the details of, of SARS-CoV-2. And, um, and some general epidemiology. And then we'll, uh, Jen, I'll come in and talk about how we, how we fit in, uh, fit the uh, track uh, study in um, to all of this. So uh, uh, COVID is caused by a virus called severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus type two, really mouthful. So you can understand why you call it SARS-CoV-2. It's an RNA virus that has a mucoid uh, coat and in its host in nature, is probably at least one, if not several bat species in East and Southeast uh, Asia. The way this virus works is that it, is that it comes into contact uh, with a receptor on the surface of human respiratory uh, cells, uh, specifically in the upper respiratory tract, meaning everything from the, you know, kind of the eyes and nose down to the, to the larynx. Uh, and uh, it infects the cells uh, and turns the cells into little viral uh, virus factories. Um, the, uh, the part that sticks to the cell that, that allows this um, uh, transfer of RNA to take place is called the spike protein or the S protein. Uh, and they actually bind to something called the um, angiotensin converting enzyme type two receptor, which just sits on the surface of the, uh, of the cells, okay? And then as the new virions are produced and assembled, uh, they uh, are extruded from the cell and go out and infect more cells. So it becomes a kind of a self-perpetuating process. Here we have the uh, 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 schematic of the, of, the, of, of the virus with the RNA inside and the spike proteins here, okay? Um, the, uh, uh, the, to blow this up, this is what it looks like. Not really, but this is kind of what it looks like. A little more like that, more than that. And at the tip, it has this uh, sort of a key that fits into the lock of the ACE2 receptor. And this is called the receptor binding domain. And this because it becomes important because when we talk about variants, um, this, uh, the configuration of this can change and it can become better or worse at binding to, to cells. So this is spread by, uh, oh, so start with. So SARS-CoV-2 infection causes the clinical disease COVID-19. And the primary clinical manifestation of COVID-19 is respiratory. And the worst one is pneumonia. Uh, it's the virus is spread by two routes, either respiratory droplets, which are sort of larger droplets when you cough or sneeze, and they can fall to, they'll, they're heavy enough that they fall to, fall to the ground. Um, for some reason, we're saying six feet. What the real answer is, is one and a half meters, but whatever. Um, and then also rare, uh, they can also um, be excreted on so-called aerosols, where there are small particles uh, that can, are, are light enough to remain in suspended um, in the air. While we talk about surfaces and, and the possibility of surface transmission, it's just that it's a possibility. Uh, and there really have been no recorded cases that have been due to uh, so-called fomite transmission or from touching uh, surfaces. So um, 
Okay, we can skip this stuff, moving on. Um, and if you think about the disease, this is a way to think about it. 40% of people who get infected have asymptomatic infection. They never develop symptoms, which is why we need, need people to wear masks because you don't know if you're infected or not. You don't have a fever, you don't feel bad, you don't feel anything, right? But you're excreting high, potentially excreting high levels of virus. Then there are people who are mildly symptomatic uh, who have kind of colds um, and they have, this is about 30%. Then you get into people who are moderately symptomatic. They start to have dropping, ox they're still, their oxygen levels are still normal, but uh, they have, well, if you did a chest CT scan or an X-ray, you would see that they have some lung abnormalities. And then finally, you get into people who start getting into the hospital, about 15% will come into the hospital. They'll, they'll have uh, low oxygen levels, uh, signs of, of respiratory distress. Um, and then another, and then of that 15, a third of them or 5% will develop critical illness where they really tip over the edge and have respiratory failure, shock, and multi-organ system dysfunction. And these are the ones that end up in the ICUs. Um, and this just gives you a kind of cartoonish way to think about this. Here's the virus. This is about 12 trillion times bigger than it really is in proportionately. And it binds to this receptor. It will enter the cell and reproduce in the cell and then get extruded back out again as, a, as a, an infectious virus. For people who get into, into trouble, it will get down into their alveoli. These are the distal air sacs in the lungs. Um, and they have, um, uh, and they can infect uh, cells here uh, as well. And then if you really start to tip over and start getting sicker and sicker and sicker, it's because you have this huge immune reaction with all these different uh, elements of the immune system uh, causing um, uh, swelling and edema. This is, this is fluid level. Um, it get blood clots in the in the um, in the vasculature, and um, this is not good. So it's a disruption of the of this barrier between the blood and the lungs, uh, blood in the air sacs, um, and this really hyperinflammatory uh, syndrome. Now, why do some people progress from? Why do some people just stay here, and why do some people move from here over to here? Well, I couldn't tell you pathophysiologic, pathophysiologically why, but there are epidemiologic features that that you know were that were that point out people who have higher risk. Older people, meaning older, meaning like 65 and older, active malignancy, chronic renal disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like emphysema, uh, certain types of cardiovascular disease like um, uh, coronary artery disease type two, not type one, type two diabetes, Down syndrome, uh, obesity, pregnancy, sickle cell disease, smoking, and solid organ transplantation. And there's more mixed evidence for things like asthma and cystic fibrosis, stroke, hypertension, immunocompromised immunosuppression, and on and on. So this is a, a kind of a complex thing. And this is an important list to remember because on next Monday, these are the people who are gonna be able to be vaccinated and maybe a few from these other lists, but it gives you an idea of this is what uh, the vaccine programs are predicated on, these strong predictors of, of progression. And another way to think about it is here early on where you have early infection and then um, kind of potentially pulmonary disease, right? And then here, then you start getting this hyperinflammatory syndrome here in the back end. The, the trick here is that this is what you can treat this with antiviral drugs like remdesivir and monoclonal antibodies, although those are really for outpatients, not inpatients. And then um, here in the hyperinflammatory phase, uh, this is where it's treated with uh, uh, dexamethasone or steroids and other types of uh, monoclonal antibodies that are designed to block the immune uh, reaction. Okay. So that's just, that's your uh, uh, COVID-101 uh, clinical picture. But um, I'm really gonna talk more about epidemiology and prevention. In the world, the countries that are, being, are most affected currently are the United States and Brazil. To a lesser extent, some, some of the larger European countries like France and Italy. And then finally, India, this is India in, in here. Um, 
there probably is a lot of, it's a fair amount of disease in Africa that's just not getting reported. The president of Tanzania um, actually is in India in a coma right now with advanced uh, SARS, the president of, or the prime minister of East Swatini, or which we used to call Swaziland, uh, died last week from this. So it's, you know, it, there's a big toll being taken. Um, in the US, there have been 29, more than 29 million cases and 528,829 deaths. Uh, you can see both cases and deaths are coming down um, in the US, although there is some flattening um, here. Uh, we still had 58,000 cases yesterday. Uh, in uh, California, we've had 3.6 million cases uh, and still had 3,464 yesterday. California, there have been 54,877 deaths, and there were an additional 257 yesterday. So these things, these tolls come up, and this, the death rate, the mortality rate, still hasn't fallen back down to where we would like it to. Um, and this is, but this is getting, starting to get pretty far down. But still, this is in the thousands, right? This is, this line here is 20,000 cases a day. Okay, so in California, <clears throat> Um, this is where the disease has been the worst, um, and in parts of Los Angeles County, one in five adults has had, had reported infection with uh, COVID-19, reported COVID-19 disease, um, and I at least use a multiplier, because given that so much is asymptomatic, I say that for every reported case, there's one, at least one um, unreported case with people who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, so if you say one in five people in certain areas in California have been reported with disease, that probably means overall in that area, something like two in five or 40% of people have been infected and have naturally acquired immunity. And when you start adding vaccination on top of that, you're getting to places, you're getting to something that's starting to look like herd immunity is something I'll talk about at the end. The other thing to, besides the geography, I'm sorry, the other thing besides the geography is this, uh, is this disproportionate, um, uh, the disproportionate burden of disease suffered among, suffered by Latinos in the state. This is the overall proportion of the Latino population in the state. And this is the uh, proportion of, of uh, cases and the proportion of deaths uh, overall. <clears throat> well, statewide, things are going well, as I showed you that curve before. Um, this is the total uh, cases in the state, or uh, so, sorry, total tests in the state, 2.4% are positive. Uh, it's down from 14% uh, as early as, the, as late as the second week of January. Cases in the hospital are down, cases in the ICUs are down. Um, it's down overall 41% uh, from the last, from two weeks ago. This is an important number in epidemiology, which is called the effective reproductive number. This is the number of secondary cases you can expect for every primary case. And in this, and currently, so if it's less than one, the cases will gradually die out because you're not replacing it. If it's equal to one, the, it, the disease will remain endemic. If it's greater than one, it'll increase. Um, and uh, overall in the state, it's uh, 0.68. Um, we've recovered our ICU capacity and we're down uh, with relatively 10 cases per 100,000 per day and 0.66 deaths per 100,000 per day. And this is the current map uh, from Tuesday of what's reopened. You can see most of the Bay Area has moved from the purple tier, which is the most restrictive, to the red tier, which is the second most restrictive. Here we are in Alameda County. So we're in, in good places <clears throat> here. And someday when we have more time, I'll make a name all the counties here. So, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a serious exercise. Um, in the Bay Area, this gives you an idea of the nine Bay Area counties. Here's Alameda, a drop in 573 cases over the last uh, week, which is a 45% decrease, which is big time. Uh, currently at 4.8 cases per 100,000 per day with an effective reproductive number of 0.69. And uh, the positive proportion positive is 1.8. Um, and here's the Bay Area again. You can see that we're still on declining. This is still going down, and deaths are going down as well. So that's all. Uh, that's all good. 
Now, um, vaccines are hugely important. We're currently in phase 1B, which are people over 65 and those who work in education, child care, emergency service, and food and ag, including all the restaurant workers. These are the people who are prioritized for receiving vaccine now. Starting Monday, you'll have people 16 to 64 with severe underlying medical conditions, which I showed you before. Um, but you'll be able to self-attest that you have those conditions. They're not going to ask you to bring in a prescription or show you, you know, show you an insulin syringe or anything like that. You just self-attest. So in California, we've had almost 10.8 million cases, I'm sorry, million doses administered. Uh, we're going on in a, along in a clip of about 150,000 doses a, a day. So if you multiply that by seven, um, that's a, a good million uh, doses a week. And in fact, um, this is actually a little bit underperforming. It's usually 200,000 doses a day, which is more like a million and a half a week. 83% of Cal, I'm sorry, 18.3% of Californians have received one dose or more and 8.5% have received more than two doses. And let's see if we have Alameda here. Here in Alameda, there have been 505,000 doses administered, uh, which corresponds to 30.8% uh, of the Alameda County population has received at least a single dose. Okay, so that's all good. We're moving, we've got great vaccines, we're moving down the ramp, we're gonna make it happen. So what can still go wrong? Well, I put these four things down here and I'll let me walk through uh, through them. Um, so the first thing to go wrong is people can stop wearing masks and, and relax. Uh, and that can be fomented by, by politicians. This is the Texas curve. This day here, when you just had this big rebound, this is the day Governor Abbott uh, uh, announced that Texans didn't, no longer needed to wear masks and that all controls were off. Probably not the most prudent thing to do. Um, this is what happened in San Francisco um, last year as we came down off the summer um, uh, spike. With, on September 1st, we moved from purple to red. On September 30th to orange and October 20th to yellow. We managed to remain at yellow for about, for about a week and then it took off again as we entered this winter spike. Uh, now we're down out of the winter spike. Um, we moved from red on the 2nd of March this is San Francisco and it's scheduled to move to orange on March 23rd and if all things go well to yellow on April 13th, which has all sorts of implications around what can be open and what can't be. CDC has also stepped into this issue of mask fatigue and has tried to tie vaccination without having to wear masks, but only in situations in which, um, in which uh, you know, people from two households, all of whom have been vaccinated get together Nobody, they don't need to wear masks or somebody, people who've been vaccinated get together with people who haven't been vaccinated, but these are at low risk, um, uh, then that's okay as well. So think of this as the grandparents going to visit the grandchildren. And then all these other kinds of things are still uh, problematic. So California is also, so the other thing is, are we maldistributing vaccine, right? So California has something called the Healthy Places Index, uh, which has given rise to a metric uh, for advancing uh, down the tiers called the Healthy um, Health uh, Equity uh, Index. Um, and it's about trying to shrink the differences between the highest quartile of, of Healthy Place Index census tracts and lowest quartile Healthy Place Index census tracts. So, you know, so in Alameda County, you're talking about what proportion of tests are positive in Piedmont versus what proportion of tests are positive in West Oakland. And we want those to be close together, okay? And this is just detail on, on what, um, what goes into the Healthy Places Index. Now, the governor got into this. Um, so this is the health equity metric I just talked about last Thursday by uh, uh, moving out as something called a vaccine equity metric. And while this is all good and we're making this pro slow progress here, he wants a big kind of kickstart of getting vaccine into the um, poorest neighborhoods, which by the way, are the ones that were the most likely to have transmission. So it makes sense from a disease control standpoint as well. And uh, if you look kind of currently, this was uh, as of uh, I think Tuesday, 
um, only 18.2% of people in the uh, lowest quartile for Healthy Places Index had been vaccinated uh, as opposed to 31.3% in the most affluent of the Healthy uh, Places Index. He set aside up 40% uh, of doses coming into California up to 4 million doses that would be preferentially given to these census tracts and your people living in these census tracts here. And the idea is that if you, sorry, if you, uh, uh, once we move out all these uh, vaccines, we can start to relax these uh, tiers. This is kind of currently where they are in terms of case rates. If we get out 2 million doses, we can move from seven per 100,000 to 10 per 100,000. If we get out, um, if we get out uh, 4 million doses, we can take the substantial thing from four to six and the orange from, um, uh, from uh, up, to, up to six, from two to six, and the yellow under two as opposed to under one. So these are big differences um, and it'll uh, go a long way to, uh, to helping out. So in Alameda County with a population of say round numbers, 1.5 million, I don't know if that's true or not, two cases per 100,000 per day, right? Would be something like the, the 30 cases a day, right? So it's still, it's not zero, and but it's, it's still a lot different than where we're running now. Now, the third thing that can go wrong is the emergence of these variants. And these are, these are um, uh, strains of the virus that have, um, that are different from the wild type circulating strains. Um, that have accumulated a number of mutations. And the, some of the mutations they've accumulated change the configuration of the spike protein that make it, that make it either more likely to bind to the ACE2 receptor as it, as it sort of pinwheels by, that's one thing, or it makes it, uh, it changes the shape of the spike protein in a way that it's harder for antibodies to see it. Um, so we're concerned both about um, increased transmission because it binds more effectively to the, uh, to the receptor, as well as um, some resistance to vaccine or to people who've been infected before and have naturally acquired antibodies. Those are both problematic. Um, this was this week in, um, uh, was the big national conference on retroviruses and opportunistic infection, the big, one of the big HIV con conferences. And they had several sessions on uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I think the emerging consensus is that we don't need to worry that much right now about these, um, about these, uh, uh, about these variants, especially the ones, the West Coast variants that have become so, so prominent in, in, in California. Okay. And in fact, one of the things that we've seen, this is a site at 24th and Mission in the city at the transit hub there, is that here in late uh, late December, November of the people who are positive, 15.7% had this West Coast variant. And then in uh, mid, mid to late January, um, this is a, you know, a month and a half later, 55% of people had one of these West Coast variants. And, and nobody had the British, the, you know, the other ones we worry about, the UK variant, the South African variant, the, the uh, Brazilian variant. So we think that this is probably a good thing. This is slightly more transmissible. Uh, and if it expands and becomes the major strain, the major clade uh, within Northern California, it may keep out the UK uh, strain, which would be a good thing. And then finally, the whole point about international uh, vaccination and, and the need to vaccinate people around the world if we're gonna truly reopen the world economy, tourism, everything else. Um, and there's a UN um, uh, program being set up called COVAX, which is about um, expanding access to COVID vaccines for low and middle income countries, basically by creating a pool of funds for, uh, to buy these. And here we are in, um, in Khartoum and Sudan and Phnom Penh and Cambodia, passing out the, uh, uh, the vaccines. Uh, so they're starting to get there, they're starting to flow, and we're starting to see vaccinations in Africa, as well as in Latin America and Europe, which is all good things. So I'm going to stop there and I am turning it over to Jenna. And George, I see a couple of questions. Can can I read those and, and, and have you answer those? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So Randy asks, 
are um, all these deaths being reported from SARS-CoV-2? How do you know that it's from COVID, not something else, such as underlying illness? Um, they are uh, because it, the COVID is the is the primary. They di died from pneumonia uh, that's caused by COVID. They may ha incidentally have a heart attack or something else, but they're it's COVID that caused the death. There are a number of other deaths, probably about twenty percent more deaths than have been recorded for COVID that are more like what you're talking about. There are people who failed to seek care um, because they were, you know, for like chest pain because they were afraid to go to the hospital or they were um, um, in Germany, there's been, um, um, there were a number of juvenile diabetics uh, who didn't, who presented in ketoacidosis uh, rather than in earlier stages of disease because they were afraid to go to the hospital. There are suicides, there are overdoses, there are a variety of other things that are part of the um, part of the lockdown, but I think we're mostly talking, um, uh, you know, kind of biological deaths that are um, uh, that are uh, somehow directly or less directly associated with COVID. If COVID didn't exist, these people wouldn't have died. Um, the next one I hear see is um, according to other COVID webinars, um, Stacy has heard that the vaccine only works for the original strain, which has almost disappeared, not the new California Cal strains. Yeah. What do you know about this? It works fine for the Cal strains, and believe me, we test this all the time. Um, and the the in fact the original strain well so the original strain disappeared in May last year. And nobody bothered to report it because <laughs> none of the press understood about variants and variants hadn't become quite so hot yet. Um, now we're, we're reporting single isolates of, of, of variants. Um, so, I mean, we're looking at all these vaccines, they seem to work fine. Uh, and um, I think, you know, when your chance comes to get vaccinated, get vaccinated. I think the other question was similar. Um, okay. Do you have an opinion about which vaccine is likely the most effective, either the two-shot series versus the single J&J uh, &J shot? The most, the vaccine that's going to be most effective for you is the one that goes into your arm. Don't mess around, just get it, right? I mean, I think this one-shot J&J vaccine, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, has some uh, strategic advantages that we could employ, like in nursing home outbreaks or something where you want to get people immune in seven days as opposed to six weeks. Um, but it's, you know, if you can get it now, get it, you know, you get immune, you get immune that much faster. You can go to Las Vegas that much faster. What can I say? It has, a, has some certain upsides to it. Great. Well, I'll uh, jump in and share a little bit about the study um, that we uh, that I get to work on with George. If that if there are no more um, if there aren't any other questions, I won't be able to see the questions now when I present. So uh, forgive me. I'll, I'll, I'll feed him. Holler, holler. If yeah. So um, I um, as I, I got to meet Wendy uh, as um, uh, one of the investigators at one of the sites that we were setting up for the study and I was really excited to be invited and have George come as well to talk with you all today. Um, the study that I'll, I'll talk about is, is a study that we're doing really for the public health departments and um, we call it the track COVID study. Um, it's a surveillance study and um, basically involves um, two different cohorts that um, we have, and, and we'll really focus on, on the on the second cohort today, the general population cohort, um, but that allows us to uh, figure out uh, what sort of is the baseline uh, prevalence and incidence of um, SARS-CoV-2 infections um, in a population that's randomly selected. And, and that I have learned as um, uh, not an epidemiologist is, is a big challenge to make sure that we get a very representative population of the Bay Area. So this was a study um, that might be funded in a country that has a very strong public health department by the public health department. But in this case, we were lucky enough to be funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And it was a collaboration between um, UCSF, George, and Dr. Maldonado, um, who is the PI at Stanford, um, as well as the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and um, 
Stanford. And then, as I said, very supported by the departments of public health uh, in the six Bay Area counties. The initial goal was to inform the sheltering in place and reopening of businesses and schools. Um, and it started back in uh, April, early May of 2020. So the primary aims of this general population study, as I mentioned, were to determine the baseline prevalence, and we'll talk about what that means, and incidence of infection, um, and the risk factors for the SARS-CoV-2 infections by following this representative longitudinal cohort um, from April last year all the way through the end of this month, March of uh, this year, and to uh, do what we could to describe the behavioral risk factors uh, that led to infections and then regularly provide study findings um, and updates to policymakers to inform decision-making. So as an academic, you don't usually spend a lot of time gathering data and then another long period of time analyzing it and writing it up. Um, this was a lot different. This was trying to understand um, what was going on in real time. So, um, but also use a lot of the, um, the important, uh, features of, of selecting, um, you know, this the epidemiological features of selecting really good population um, to get results, real-time results. So how do we do this? Um, we call this a general population cohort, the six Bay Area counties, San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara, Alameda, your county, Contra Costa County, and um, Marin. And um, the sample size uh, was had to make an estimate about what we thought the rate of infections would be um, to figure out if we would have enough uh, power to determine to answer the questions and to detect differences, uh, rises and falls in the incidents over time. So it was decided that we needed about 4,000 people to follow across um, the Bay Area. And we used um, a household probability sample, um, which means um, we randomly selected 60,000 addresses, sent them sent, and sent postcards out uh, to those 60,000 households. And um, if you received a postcard and you were asked to, the person in the household whose birthday was next was asked to enroll, and you had to um, have not previously had a positive um, infection, but otherwise that was the only entry criteria. So we wanted to make sure each county had a minimum number, even though some of the counties are less populous than another. So 300 was a minimum per county. And the big, um, I think one of the, the, the features that was really interesting um, to me was the idea that um, the sampling of the counties was done such that we could oversample in areas where um, the zip code or census tracts where there was higher rates of infection so that we could understand a little bit more granularity those and, and capture more of the positive cases in those areas and be able to wait back to a general um, to give us an answer across the, the whole community. So it wasn't perfectly weighted across the Bay Area. It was weighted in populations where we thought would have a higher risk based on geography and when the study started. So where were the infections when the study started? Um, and so we wanted to sample a greater proportion of participants from those high risk strata or those high risk groups. So here's one of the postcards that we sent out trying to recruit, um, you know, people across that from lots of different cultures, lots of different languages, um, make sure, you know, populations that were traditionally not excited to participate in research. You know, when in a situation like this where the virus affects everybody, it's really important to get, you know, sort of every type of person. Um, and so we focused a lot on translating um, postcards and letters and invitations, multiple languages. Um, we had community community benefit organizations. So people really on the ground, knocking on doors, helping to explain what the study was in the original language of the various households um, to try to really get a good, um, well-distributed population. The enrollment took a little longer than we had hoped, but went from July all the way to December. Um, and then we followed um, people uh, through the end of this month. So at baseline, um, everyone gets a questionnaire and that asks a lot of information about um, sort of you know, who they were as people and what their situa living situation was like, their socio-demographics. 
what kind of behaviors, like what were their general, um, what was their occupation, what their um, practices were in terms of their risk, their behaviors, um, what their exposures were like, were they healthcare workers, were they um, essential workers. Um, we also had a survey about what are their attitudes about vaccines and were they interested in getting a vaccine and what was their intention about getting the vaccine. And again, these were translated in multiple languages. We set up, um, we soon realized while well, we started with two sites, one at UCSF and one at Stanford, because that was easy for us, we soon realized that people weren't going to be interested in traveling um, far to do their tests, especially when they became more ubiquitous and available. In the very beginning, people were willing because there weren't a lot of tests available. Um, so we set up sites, 14 sites throughout the counties. and. Um, and every time people came in, they came in once a month, they received a nasal pharyngeal swab um, to look for active infection. And then they received a venous blood draw to look for um, antibodies. And that would tell us a little bit about what their previous infection may have been. And the nasal swab would tell us a little bit about their current uh, status of infection. The results were put in part of the medical record, whether your testing site was affiliated with UCSF or Stanford, and it was, it was transmitted to the county, which is the regulation for testing um, during the pandemic. So all of this information was available to the counties um, and then also to uh, participants providers. Um, everyone who participated got a $25 gift card um, and that was um, you know, every month. So here is sort of the distribution of the various sites that we had um, here. Let's see, where did I meet Wendy? <laughs> Probably over here, maybe in Pleasanton, or I can't remember. I think it was in Pleasanton. Um, and uh, so we had partners with Alameda County, Contra Costa County, Marin, San Francisco, San Mateo, and then also a lot of uh, the clinics that we worked with, um, some Stanford clinics and some UCSF clinics. Down here, these are, are sort of um, overlapping each other, but we have a great partner um, to reach the San Jose area, the Gardner Health Clinics. Um, and um, so that was a, a, a wonderful partnership um, that we could work alongside them um, to, to sort of get a nice distribution. So the pretty wide area all the way down to Gilroy, Antioch, San Rafael, so pretty wide area to cover. And I thought it might be fun to see sort of what, how did, this is how um, we sort of talked with the counties and provided um, information for them. This is a live up, you know, dashboard that had, was updated on a weekly basis with all of our, the new test results. Um, and, and so the county could take a look at this and get a sense for um, what we were doing and what we were finding. Um, a little different than their population rate, where they obviously have a lot of testing that they're doing, but those are people that have symptoms, people that might be flying. You don't really know why they're getting tested. This case will, what was helpful in the sense that they're able to see the asymptomatic rate of infection, you know, how many people were um, maybe unknowingly infected to help inform some of the um, measures of um, asymptomatic conversion rates and things like that. So you can see here, this is our um, total enrollment by county. Um, we had targets for those for each of those. And I think we fell a little short in the Contra Costa area. Basically, it took us a little longer to get set up there. Um, and this is the distribution by um, institution. And this is the strata that I was talking about. We really wanted to oversample in the high risk strata. Um, and so we did, we, we, we reached a little bit of that, but you can see most of the people that we enrolled came from a medium risk um, geographic area. You can see how um, things break out about, um, you know, by county. And as you go, hmm, that one doesn't look good. Let's look at this one. <laughs> as you go into the, um, you can go in a, into a little bit further, we can see here by the, um, this is a, a, a view that we would share uh, directly and it has annotations for the, for the counties. And we can show a little bit more about sort of the characteristics of, of those who become positive. Um, so the um, mask use, for example, um, within the various, you know, what was the max use across the, the various counties? This is self-reported in their surveys. Um, what did it, how did it look um, for the incident and prevalent population versus the general cohort where people less likely to wear masks? 
the ones that became positive, you know, in this case, it looks like no, you know, so these types of questions, um, you could see in real time as we were collecting the data. And I thought it might be just useful to talk overall about what the results um, have been to date. It's really been a relatively low frequency that we're seeing in our population. You can see, so prevalence is, um, is shown by the antibody status at baseline. So if someone comes into the study and they actually already have antibodies, that would indicate that they had had a past infection at some point. And we call that sort of a snapshot or a prevalence rate at baseline. And we have a rate that's relatively low at 1.4%. Or 53 cases. And then we have an overall incidence. So how many people have become infected, you know, over time. So either they developed um, a positive test, um, or they, um, and that would be either of active infection where we catch an active infection or a new antibody, meaning they started out negative, and then they developed a new antibody. Um, and uh, you can see that that rate looks, again, it's about 7.8 per 100 person years. So as we follow people over time, this is how many people that have, have developed um, the, in our cohort, the, the virus. And then finally, we're also keeping track of who's been vaccinated. And so within our population, we're a little bit ahead of the numbers we see in California with roughly 27% have, have already um, received the vaccine. So that's all I have. Um, would it make sense to um, ask questions or if there are any questions or happy to ask. Um, I'm sure George would be happy to answer questions as well. There are Thanks. a few questions. Um, Please. I don't know if you want me to read them or if George, you want to read them. Go ahead, go ahead, Sierra. Okay. Um, the first question is, any idea on how they are going to monitor or track the people who are vaccinated and able to, able to not wear their mask? So, uh, uh, so there's a. Um, uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess I'm gonna interpolate what this question is about. Uh, I think what you're gonna start to see is greater enforcement of mask wearing. Um, this is the, you know I think people are don't really are I mean the public health departments are very un uh, uninterested in having yet another surge uh, that's precipitated by everybody throwing their masks away. Um, and so you're going to start seeing more uh, more enforcement. So if everybody's sitting around a bar and nobody has on masks, which is sort of hard to do when you're drinking, but you know you can imagine a scene of everybody's jammed in, the alcoholic beverage control will close the bar, which means it's like a fifty thousand dollar fine. So there's not going to be. A, I mean, it's probably going to go more after businesses uh, than individuals. Uh, but the the point is is that the only time you don't have to wear a mask. Is if you're in your if you're in a private setting, with uh, another couple, both of whom have been vaccinated, and then aside from the and then some very kind of things about some sort of minor things about visiting your grandchildren, which none of you guys have to put up with yet. I'm just guessing, um, and uh, you know the idea that you could have sort of vaccinated grandparents and unvaccinated grandchildren, and you could get them together. Um, that's a, but the grandchildren, and if these are children, children, if they're little children, not like 25 year old grandchildren. Um, George, do you think if I got vaccinated out of bars. <laughs> and would I have to carry my card around if I'm not going to wear my mask? Is that, do you think that's going to happen? No, you're going to have to wear your mask. Yes. Yeah, so even if I'm vaccinated and the people I'm around are vaccinated. It's in private okay. settings. Okay. Now, we may eventually get to a point where people are carrying vaccine passports. This is very controversial, uh, but in certain European countries, uh, this is being heavily pushed, and in states in the U.S. So New York, if you want to go into a restaurant, you have to show your card that says you've been vaccinated. Okay. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen what these cards look like. Let's see if I can pull, out my, pull mine out here. I stapled it into my passport. Okay. So it's, it's like a joke, right? It's a piece of paper. <laughs> you could easily right? make one. <laughs> yeah, 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 I could have made one when I was in second grade, you know, um, don't do that. I didn't say to do that. Don't do that. But it's not, you know, it's not some big high security uh, kind of thing. Now there's a lot of discussion about having QR codes and, and stuff on your phones. 
but for right now, um, that's the, you know, there, there's not, there are not plans yet in California to have vaccine passports. But I would imagine towards the end of the summer. Oh, by the way, President Biden just said everybody's going to get vaccinated by the Fourth of July. That just came across the wires while you were we were talking. Um, I think that that's you know as we get past the Fourth of July, these things are going to be asked more and more and more and more, and um, people are going to want to you know throw away their masks, um, and we're probably going to be pushed uh, to have come up with some system for people to uh, not have to wear masks. Okay, um, thank you. The next question is, is effectiveness of the vaccine tested only by looking at neutralizing antibodies? Uh, Jenna's husband's the king <laughs> of the T cell. Uh. You yeah, no, I think I'll be happy to take this one. So the, um, you know, we do look at neutralizing antibodies as re relates to the samples that we're collecting as part of our study. That's really important to see how well these antibodies um, are working against um, sort of working against the virus specifically. But that's just one tiny part of a whole immune response. And so that's something we keep in mind. Um, there's a whole other parts of the immune system, the T cell mediated um, part that remembers, you know, that can see and, and, and also attack and help prevent, um, you know, bad infections and remember that you've seen this virus before and provide immunity. So I think that um, when you talk about neutralizing antibodies, it's definitely something that we look at with vaccines, but it's not necessarily the whole picture. Okay, and why would the vaccine for the cow strains and not the European or African strain um, work and how are they different? So the uh, the vaccines are bro have broadly neutralizing capacity because they have because after natural infection, right, you get like fifty different classes of antibodies, right, and so there's enough to attach to the virus in places that haven't been haven't been changed by the mutations. What? Uh, but remember, this is about kinetics, and so following a, 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 an immunization and I'm just gonna talk about neutralizing antibodies. We could talk about T cells as well, but let's just talk about neutralizing antibodies. You have 17 times more virus, more, I'm sorry, 17 times more antibody than you need to keep the virus from, from uh, reproducing itself, which means attaching to the cell. Um, now, if you have one of these variants that uh, the antibody doesn't attach to as efficiently, um, you have, it, it, instead of having 17 times too much, you have something like three times too much. So while there's a six fold drop in the amount of, of, vir of amount of antibody you have, you still have way, uh, you know, way more than you need to stop transmission. And the, so the Cal uh, strains are, uh, which have a, sp a specific mutation in them um, that actually make them a little bit more transmissible, but not more resistant to um, uh, to the uh, to antibody uh, to uh, the antibodies. Um, that's what that's what they have going for them. The South African and the Brazilian have both. Uh, so, um, but it's still we still produce enough enough antibody after vaccination to be able to block these uh, the, the attachment of these uh, viruses. Um, if the vaccine only lasts for five to eight months, would booster shots be required every six months for the rest of our life? No. So this, the vaccine is going to last, the, the vaccine is probably going to last pretty much for like a long, 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 long time, right? How People say, how long has it lasted? It's lasted 11 months because the first doses were given in April last year in phase one trials. Okay. That's what we know. But there's no reason to think that you're getting waning immunity. You get, yes, neutralizing antibodies go down, but as Jenna was saying, you have T cell uh, memory, you have B cell memory. There's lots of other pieces of the immune system that don't deteriorate over time and will respond to this. Having some of the uh, paper, there's one paper that's from the previous SARS epidemic, right? Yeah. Where we can see antibodies that are against this version of yeah. coronavirus. So that's yeah. over 10 or 15, is it 15 years then? So it's 2002. been 2002. Yeah. 2002, how quick they forget, 18 years. <laughs> so 18 years people have had, have recurrence 
that you can see the antibodies that they had from that infection are also helpful. Yeah, these, in these antibodies aren't hanging around. They're made as you, as you, get, uh, as you get exposed to this. So the, um, let's see, where was I on this? I got, uh, 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 tell me what, what did I miss? I interrupted, sorry, George. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, oh, oh uh, the reason you're gonna need to get revaccinated is because of these, stra of these new strains. If we start getting new, new, new strains that really are resistant to the current vaccines, then we're gonna to have to start putting different strains in the vaccines, and then you're gonna to have to get revaccinated. But for the, for the one you have now, it's gonna work for a long, long time. The question is, is what difference does that make if, you really, if there really is a change in, the, in what makes up the, um, in what, what the big circulating strains are. So it's kind of like flu. The you know, antibodies we make to flu vaccine last forever that kind of flu isn't around, right? So you gotta, that's why you have to get flu vaccines every year. Um, and how is the exceptionally low storage temp requirements for these vaccines impacting the uh, deployment globally? Uh, well, it was gonna be an easy question until you added the word globally. Um, <laughs> so, the, uh, uh, so the Pfizer vaccine, which has had the most extreme cold, uh, 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 requirements, which was that it had to be stored at minus 70 degrees centigrade. Um, that's now, um, they, they've been doing testing and it works just as well at minus 20, which is a pretty standard uh, type of uh, freezer that's available in most places. Um, in terms of distribution globally, it depends on where we're talking about. If we're talking about doing this in Gabon or someplace where people are taken around on motorcycles, that becomes a big sweat. If we're talking about doing it in a big city with pharmacies that all have these refrigerators and stuff, it's less of a sweat. Um, but you know, the cold chain, this is called cold chain in, in vaccines. The cold chain is a big deal. And um, it's gonna be, as we start to move into more and more rural areas and use and have, sort of have less and less uh, uh, sophisticated trans, uh, uh, transportation to get there, uh, we're going to have to work out, uh, we're either going to have to use vaccines that don't have to be frozen and it can be refrigerated like the J&J &J vaccine, um, or we're going to have to wake, work out little carrying kits that uh, people can use to transport vaccine. And um, this question says, minority communities seem to be misinformed in regard to the development of the vaccine and are hesitant to receive them. Uh, what do you think the state or government agencies should be doing to target these communities? Well, one of the things that I, I think that's 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 probably true, um, unfortunately. And um, one of the things I know that we've done as a, a as a study group is to um, help the counties understand a little bit more about why people might be, why minorities might feel the way they do about getting a vaccine. And so we've learned several things. And I think being able to give that information back to the counties allows like sort of the messaging to get out through, not only through the right people, it's like who to deliver the message. Um, we've learned, for example, um, different communities may see their religious leader as to be, you know, more important in terms of distributing the message versus um, everybody actually seems to like um, Anthony Fauci and, and George Rutherford. Like those are the people we love to hear from scientific experts, right? Um, but not everybody wants to hear from the nurse at their office or the public health, local public health officials, you know, they don't trust these sources. So I think um, we've learned a little bit through our vaccine surveys across this representative population, um, how to communicate and what's the message um, can be, where the, where the information is, um, you know, where is the misinformation? Yeah, and, and it's it, this it's a this is a problem, right? And because it's going to produce pockets of people who aren't vaccinated, and if the virus gets into those pockets, you're going to have ongoing transmission. If you have ongoing transmission, you're going to have mutations, right? And there, that's where that's how we're going to breed um, more and more and more complex variants. So you know, it behooves us to. Uh, to figure this out and get as many people vaccinated uh, as possible. And that's everything. So the, if you watch TV, which I know none of you ever do because you're studying too hard. Uh, but if you watch TV, 
what you're going to see, it, you'll, you're going to see messaging around this, especially if you watch things that are, um, uh, you know, that are, uh, that may be targeted to more say, for instance, African-American populations like basketball games, just to pick a, to just one at random. Um, and, you know, you're going to see messaging around that both, and it's mostly from the state, a little bit from CDC. Um, but the idea is to try and reduce vaccine hesitancy to get people to where they can say, yes, let's do it. Okay, and how will the division between states that are taking the epidemic seriously and those that are enabling spread be resolved? And doesn't interstate travel reduce the effectiveness of many programs? Correct, so that's a great question. So the whole idea of herd immunity, which I didn't really get into. Herd immunity is this concept from veterinary medicine that if you have enough cows that are immune, right, in a herd, no, you're not going to be able to sustain transmission because the virus or the bacterium or whatever isn't going to be able to find a new susceptible host, right? It's because they're, they're so few and far between. It's just a probabilistic argument. The, uh, you know, you can't say we're going to achieve herd immunity in California, okay? Because California mixes with other states, right? You have to really, uh, 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 you have to think of this at a larger level. Now we could talk about the Bay Area because there's not a ton of mixing outside of the Bay Area until everything reopens up and people start coming from all over the world here, then we got a problem. But we need to think about this as a, as a kind of a universal whole. Um, and, you know, um, so if we think about California, right, the state with the largest population on our border, on our, on our California border is Baja, California. With uh, and the San Diego Tijuana border crossing is the most cross border in the world on a daily basis with 325,000 border crossings. So like pretending nothing's happening in Mexico isn't gonna help at all, right? So we have to think kind of beyond, the, uh, beyond our little world here. Um, you know, frankly, if you wanna know what I wanna do with Texas, you know, if I were the secretary of state, I think I might, I, this is facetious, don't worry is that uh, we could, maybe we could trade Texas for Baja, California with Mexico. I think that might be a good deal. Get all that good surfing beaches in Baja, California, get rid of Texas and Texans. You know, it, you know I could see that. I'm just making, I'm, I'm, being, you know, I'm just goofing here, don't worry. I'm not really gonna do that. Um, but I think, you know, you gotta, the point is, is that states that uh, have, have, you know, act precipitously for political reasons are not helping uh, and, President Biden used the adjective Neanderthal. Um, uh, the governor said, uh, Governor Newsom said reckless. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, uh, you know, somebody needs to get, we need to, yeah, I think the more and more we have is a, a really uniform national policy will be the better off we'll be. Jenna, care to comment? No, you said it well. <laughs> Um, the next question is, do you think there will eventually be a mandate on being vaccinated as a requirement for employment? Um, this person says that they currently work with staff that were vaccinated in January, except for one person. Um, do you think if you don't have an underlying condition that it would still be required for employment? I think we'll eventually get there. Right, right now, um, private employers can demand it as a condition of employment. Public employers can't unless there's a, uh, unless it, until it gets licensed. Remember these just have emergency use authorization, which is a lower standard. Um, if they get licensed, then we could start talking about mandatory, vac mandatory vaccination. As you, may, as you may know, the military cannot require this, okay? Law enforcement doesn't, can't require it. Uh, nursing homes um, currently are not requiring it of people who work in nursing homes. Uh, so it's you're you're kind of bent over this problem of of not having it back, not having it uh, licensed yet, and then still it's going to be hugely controversial. Let's maybe um, do one more question because we're actually kind of out of time, and um, we could go on for a long time. I'm sure there's a lot more questions in the um, chat, but um, let's just do one more. So um, you're going to make me pick. <laughs> um, 
Okay. And then you can just type the next one. That's fine. Okay. Um, will monoclonal antibodies be pushed as a remedy to prevent the worsening of COVID-19 in patients if new strains keep developing? Uh, so monoclonal antibodies are, um, this is what President, uh, uh, what's his name, Trump got. Um, and monoclonal antibodies are, can be used, are, are most efficiently used before people get hospitalized or in their very early stages of hospitalization. They can't start to deteriorate. They don't make any uh, difference at that point in time. So we wanna see more monoclonal antibodies used. They're complicated. They're uh, because people are, are infectious, you know, they don't want to bring them into the dialysis unit and give them there. So the hospitals have to set up special places uh, to give them because they're all intravenous. Um, but uh, the, the problem is, is if, as these strains start to change, um, then they may or may not work. And, and that's a, that's a, that becomes another design uh, problem. So we'll have to see how that goes. I know there's a question here about why do if the if the vaccines work? Why would we might need to get uh, not boosters, but so much uh, second doses, uh, different uh, different preparations? It's they work fine now. It's in the future is what we're talking about. If they could, if mutations continue to occur and accumulate, Jenna, you guys, Jenna does tons of of testing on all sorts of new new you know state of the art antivirals and monoclonals and stuff. What do you? What do you think is going to, going to happen? Yeah, you know, with the mono, I mean, we, we do do a lot of trials with new therapies and um, the monoclonal antibodies and specifically have to be made to attack a certain specific protein, right? And so if there is, if there is a specific monoclonal antibody for a specific strain, you know, mutant strain, it could be very useful. But um, as the the virus evolves, it might be that the monoclonal antibodies made previously, you need to be updated, right? So you have to stay up with it. So I do think it's one of many therapies. There's some antiviral therapies um, that have shown some, some good impact as well. Um, we have some other, uh, some new data will be coming out in the next weeks or so. So, I, I mean, I think there's some hope um, for some good therapies. Great, that's a great um, final question. Thank you all very much. And thank you very much, Dr. Rutherford and Dr. Boiki. That was so interesting for all of us. We really appreciate that you came to talk to us. And there's Wendy popped up, yes. Thank you, Wendy, for um, organizing that with us. So, um, yep, thank you all. And I wish you a good rest of the evening. And I hope to see we'll you speaking at the ASM meeting. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Bye. 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 I think Don turned the light off on me. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> let's see. Can we? I'm gonna go off it then. Well, I counted 74 people or so, Barbara. Yes, I did too. So I just, I'm just removing everybody. There were 69 okay. without uh, okay. people These who people weren't involved. Stay, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to, I had some of my students still out there. So yeah, that was uh, pretty successful, I think, right? And it Very was nice. really yeah. interesting. Well done. Really interesting. And, and I think they were questions. very good. He's explained things well. He's very well. And and she's they played together nicely. Yes. 
Yeah. So I, um, I hope you get them to talk at the, have you already confirmed it? For no, the because <laughs> we're still trying to figure out our Zoom and all this. I mean, maybe I should just do it on Zoom here for once, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know how what I mean? Just because it'd be we... easier. <laughs> yeah. How many people can we have a maximum? Do you a know, thousand. Gene? A thousand. A wow. thousand. Yeah, that's, that's nice. that should be enough, right? Yeah. 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 So for our organization, I'm looking into. Uh, we're we're going to be doing a bunch of these um, these talks, these seminars, and I'm trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out. We got. Um, what did we get? Um, the Microsoft product, I think. Oh no, it was some product we didn't like. <laughs> we we really like Zoom because everybody knows Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, 